was, uh, as Steve said, it was a very pretty day out and everything, and uh, so it's, it's nice to be able to celebrate God's Sabbath day. So, uh, yeah, Steve, if you want to hit the first, first slide there. What I'm going to be talking about, while well, Steve gets that slide up, is uh, well, kind of what we've, been, what we've been hearing about in the news for the last month. Um, talk about it from a perspective. Oh, there's Steve and Renee back there. I didn't see him earlier. Sorry about that. This is Gaza City as it looks today. Well, then now as it looked probably up until maybe a month ago. Okay, it's modern day Gaza. It's the main city of what we know today as the Gaza Strip. And of course, most of us know what happened four weeks ago on this very day. Four weeks ago, and the world was stunned and shocked and horrified when more than a thousand Hamas terrorists streamed out of Gaza. The Gaza Strip, mostly from Gaza City and from all the tunnels and so forth under there, uh, right, right at daybreak and right after daybreak to attack nearby Jewish settlements. <clears throat> and with just over two, maybe three hours, they killed some 1,400 people. They killed men, women, and children. They didn't spare even babies, as we know, and I will spare you the gory details of what they did to some of those babies. Um, but of the main population, the main people, some of them were shot, some were stabbed, some were beheaded. You know, that horror and Israel's response to it has dominated world attention over the past month. But what most of the world, and what most of the news media did not report, but which we, of course, in the church are aware, is that that attack took place on the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. What we might call the last great day. Of course, the Jews call that whole feast Sukkot. That's their Hebrew name for it. Now, that timing, of course, was intentional. Just as we know that the Yom Kippur War was launched in October of 1973, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in Judaism and what we call the Day of Atonement, Hamas did not, did not just arbitrarily picked this day. They wanted to pick a day that was holy to the Jewish people to inflict this attack. You know that many of those killed on that day were young people, hundreds of young people, maybe over a thousand, I don't know how many, they were atta uh, attending a Jewish, they, the, the news media simply called it a music festival. I think we all recognize it was a, it was a glorious outpouring of joy and celebration over the last great day, the last day of Sukkot. And this is the day that they chose to inflict the suffering and horror that they, that they chose to do. These young people were standing out there. They were, they were dancing and singing to God. And some of them began to notice hang gliders coming in. And as those hang gliders came in closer, they could see that the, the men piloting those hang gliders were dressed mostly in black. They had face, their cover, faces were covered, and they had the green headband of Hamas the Arabic terrorist group. There, uh, some of these others, of course, came on motorcycles, mopeds, by, in the backs of trucks, but they all had one aim in common, and that was to kill, to rape, to maim, and to destroy. And that's what they did for two to three horrible hours. Let's show, if we can, Steve, the second. There we see Hamas rockets fired from Gaza. That very day, part of that attack was Hamas launching thousands of rockets from the Gaza Strip into Israel. Now, uh, anybody here heard, are familiar with the term Iron Dome? The Iron Dome? The Iron Dome is a very sophisticated anti-missile system uh, that Israel had, uh, has uh, devised. And I remember when we were living in Huntsville, Huntsville being the, uh, the aerospace and defense center that it is, I heard a very interesting presentation by an Israeli defense uh, a high official from the Israeli Defense Forces talking about the Iron Dome. And the Iron Dome is something they've had now for probably about 20 years, and it's pretty effective. So the Iron Dome was able to intercept a lot of those rockets. So in response to this horrendous attack, the Israeli Defense Forces immediately began planning a massive offensive of Gaza. What was their aim? Their aim was to destroy Hamas. Hamas had been a thorn in the side of Israel for decades, and their aim was to finally eradicate Hamas. So over the past month, though, Hamas has continued their attacks. Uh, they're, firing, they're still firing those rockets into Israel. Put up that slide again, Steve, if you will, okay? I want everybody to see that. 
This has been going on not just the day of the attack. This has been going on every single day since the Hamas attacks. If, just leave it up there, if you will, Steve, until we get rid of it for the next one. So I, what I want to do today is talk about the parallel. Is there a parallel between these horrific attacks and ancient times? Has Israel always been bothered and distressed by the people coming out of that area? As we will see, yes, that is the case. We know that ancient Israel had to deal with enemies from the area which we know today as Gaza. What we know about this ancient land, but I could say, what do we know about this ancient land and its inhabitants? People who for centuries were a problem to Israel, harassed Israel constantly. Let's uh, go to the next slide, Steve, of the map of ancient land of the Philistines. As you can see here, this was ancient Philistia, the area known today as the Gaza Strip. Now, that's just a little bit of history here. Bear with me. Uh, this, has been, uh, this area has been occupied for about 4,000 years or more longer. Actually, it, it's probably been occupied for a, a, at least a couple thousand years before the Israel, Israelites came into the area. Who occupied it? To begin with, it was, uh, it was Canaanite tribes. Let's turn, if you will, first scripture to Deuteronomy 2.23. Deuteronomy 2.23. Well, this is not a scripture we, we uh, ever refer to very much. Um, I'm going to actually begin with verse 22. Just as he had done for the descendants of Esau, who dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them, they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place even to this day. And the Avim, who dwell in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftorim, who came from Kaftor, destroyed them, and dwelt in their place. Now, that sounds a little bit vague. What was he talking about? But the Avim were the original, very early Canaanite uh, inhabitants of what is today known as the Gaza Strip, or the area of Palestine. Okay? The Avim who dwelt in the walled cities as far as Gaza. When the Israelites came into the, actually before that, when, when Jacob blessed his 12 sons, you know, we all know the scene there, I think it's from Exodus 20 or 47, 48, something like that. When Jacob divided up the land of Israel between his 12 sons, he awarded the area of Gaza to Judah, to the tribe of Judah and Judah's descendants. Now, the tribe of Judah did not actually ever settle in Gaza. They basically left it to the Canaanites, which was bad enough because, you know, God had spelled out to them why they should get rid of the Canaanites with their idols and their human sacrifice and all the other things. But in the 11th century B.C., there again, pardon me throwing out these dates, uh, but 11th century B.C., and that would be about a, a century approximately before Saul became uh, the judge over, I mean, the first king of Israel, a group of people from what is now known as Greece today, from a seafaring people from what we now know as Greece, colonized that area. And they drove out the Canaanite tribes, and they established colonies there. And they called themselves Philistines, or in Hebrew, Fishtim, okay? And it basically refers to what was, what was originally a seafaring people. So our modern word, Palestine, which we use today to refer to that whole area of Israel, our modern Palestine, uh, derives from that ancient Philistine term. Now, the Philistines were no ordinary people. The Philistines were an advanced and prosperous and very highly intelligent people. They were probably the first in the, in the world, as far as we know, to use bronze for their weapons and for making implements and so forth. They kind of implemented what we call today the Bronze Age. These were, these were an advanced people. Their weapons and bronze chariots were superior to those of the early Israelites. The early Israelites probably used wooden helmets covered with leather. The Philistines used bronze helmets. And as we're going to see a little bit later, their weapons were highly fashioned out of bronze too. But these were pagans. They, they, were, they served a mixture of both ancient Greek and Babylonian gods. They practiced human sacrifice. They ate pigs and dogs. We know that from, our, from archaeological digs and finds in modern times in those ancient, uh, ancient Philistine cities. 
They also built eight temples to their pagan gods. The most important of those gods was what they called Dagon, or the fish god. A lot of what the Bible tells us about the Philistines is found in Judges. So let's turn to Judges 16, verse 21 to 24. Judges 16, verse 21 to 24. So here the Philistines are really beginning to be a problem to Israel. I probably should have had that in Mark. 16, 21 to 24. That would be a good time for me to put my glasses on. <laughs> These old eyes are just not as responsive as they used to be. Now, this is the account. Give it a little, little context here. This is the account of Samson being, being captured, okay? Uh, Samson is finally uh, Delilah, uh, the beautiful Phallus, uh, uh, Philistine woman that he took up with, has finally enticed him to tell the secret of his strength that he has, and so the Philistines have captured him. They put his eyes out. So now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, our god has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. Now keep in mind, Samson had killed perhaps hundreds of Philistines already. They, they couldn't stand him. They, he, he was public enemy number one to the Philistines. When the people saw him, they praised their god and said, our god has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So we know that the Philistines, uh, they had this big feast to Dagon. They, they sacrificed to Dagon and other gods, but he was the principal one. So this, this passage talks about the Philistines celebrating their capture of, of Samson. That was their big event. So they offer a great sacrifice to Dagon or sacrifices. Uh, and this is where Samson, of course, prays that his strength might be renewed. His hair has also started growing out from all of his months in prison. Remember that the long hair was a source of his strength. He took a Nazarite vow. So God answers his prayer, and he brings down the temple of Dagon, killing hundreds of Philistines and himself. Uh, and as the Bible says there, he killed more Philistines at his death than he ever killed in his life. So... From this point on, more than a century has passed, and after a long time ruled by the judges, Israel petitions Samuel, of course, as we know, God's prophet, to, to give them a king like the nations around him. So God listened to their prayer. He instructed Samuel to, uh, to seek out Saul and anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. And, of course, one of Saul's earliest tasks, his great mandate from the people, you might say, was to try to rid Israel of the Philistine influence and dominance. Because the Philistines at this time were exacting tribute from the Israelites. They basically, they basically ruled over the Israelites at that time. So when we read in 1 Samuel 8, and there's no need to turn there, about the army that Saul would raise and all that the cost of that army would be and how the young men would be conscripted and the young women would be uh, you know, uh, conscripted to act as bakers and, uh, you know, make uniforms and so forth. That army was primarily to fight the Philistines. But let's turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, I think most of us are familiar with this, the account of Goliath, David and Goliath. I want to point out a few things here. 1 Samuel 17. By this time, Saul has been king for, you know, at least two years, maybe three years, maybe more. So 1 Samuel 17, where we see Goliath introduced, the giant who challenged Israel's army. Let's read verses 1 through 9. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at, at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and uh, Azekah in uh, Ephrath Damim, difficult names to pronounce, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So now, picture this. The Philistines were on one side of this valley. There's a stream between them, and the army of Israel is on the other side. The Philistines stood on the mountains on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. Gath was one of the ancient cities of uh, uh, the Philistia, whose height was six cubits in a span, probably 
at least eight and a half to maybe nine foot, possibly ten feet tall. And he had a, what we say about the Bronze Age, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat of mail was 5,000 shekels of bronze. I don't know how much that is, probably several hundred pounds, what that bronze coat of mail. So he was armed with armament superior to anything that the Israel, Israelite army had. He was, and he was, you know, as big as probably two and a half to three average soldiers, and he was ferocious. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, big old, like that, you know? And his, bron and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. And he cried out, stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and have you and you these servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Basically, continue to serve us is what he what what really meant. So the rest of this chapter, we won't take the time to read it, but the rest of this chapter tells you know, a story that we're familiar with, how young David, he's only recently been anointed the king of Israel, that happened in the previous chapter, uh, answers Goliath's defiant challenge to the army of Israel. So using a sling, you know, he knocks Goliath unconscious, then uh, runs up, takes Goliath's own sword, which was, who knows, may have been that long, and beheads him. Now, God's exploits through David would continue. Later as king, David is the one who God uh, finally uses to defeat the Philistines and begin a period of peace and prosperity that lasts through the reign of Solomon, his son. Okay. Well, so that was nearly 3,000 years ago. What has happened to Gaza in the time since? Now, we won't take the time, uh, it'll be very time-consuming and, and dull to detail the many peoples that have inhabited Gaza since then, and that's not really the purpose of this message anyway. But let's fast forward to today and see that Gaza is one of the most densely populated areas on the face of the earth, okay? So here we see, um, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Palestine uh, showing Gaza City and Ashkelon now. If you can see the line there uh, or, or in the, around in the pink, that shows the area of the current Gaza Strip. That's where all the trouble now is coming from. And you see Gaza City there. That would probably be where ancient Gath, the city of Gath where Goliath came from, is from. But you see Ashkelon to the north, and this map does not show Ashdod. I couldn't find one that showed Ashkelon and Ashdod. But those two cities are part of modern Israel. They have the ancient Philistine names, but they're part of modern Israel. Okay? So this is the situation that, we're, that we face today. Uh, the terrorists, the uh, attackers came out of the Gaza Strip, mostly from that northern area there around Gaza City, uh, and attacked. And of course, this area today, the Gaza Strip, is one of the most densely populated areas on the face of the earth today. Over 2 million people live in an area of just about 140 square miles right there. Now, let's, go, let's come up to our present time. So well, let's come up to 1948. 1948, the modern nation of Israel is formed. The United Nations, seeing the suffering of the Jewish people in World War II and other things, other reasons, decide to partition Palestine between the Palestinians, the Arab Palestinians, and the Jewish people. But as soon as that, as that uh, was done, uh, in May of 1948, the Palestinians declare war on this new infant nation of Israel, uh, along with the nations surrounding Israel, surrounding Palestine, uh, basically Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, and to some extent Lebanon. They all declare war on the infant nation of Israel. But what happened? God must have blessed uh, the Israelites back in 1948. Israel prevailed and even slightly increased their land holdings. And uh, probably if I had time, I could have found a map that showed the original 
what they call the division between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, and you could see that after that initial war, they increased the size of their nation. And of course, as we know, since 1948, there have been several wars have broken out. There was a war in 1956, there was a war in 1967, and another war, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And in 1967 especially, Israel was uh, prevailed and actually increased the size of their nation to where they, they took over the Gaza Strip and they took over what's called the West Bank. So now we have Israel uh, with a nation that has at least somewhat defensible borders. But the past 35 years since that time have not been, uh, have not been at all peaceful for Israel. There have been two, there have been several there are constant strife happening over there. There have been two major uprisings in the past 35 years. What, the, uh, what in Arabic they call the intifada. Anybody heard that term, intifada? So the intifadas, that's Arabic for uprising, for revolt. Uh, and in the intifadas, uh, basically you have uh, all kinds of horrific things going on. Uh, uh, suicide bombers, uh, lots of explosives, uh, mass gunmen making midnight raids and killing people. Uh, those are just basically violent attacks on the nation of Israel. Now, it's happened so much in the last 35, 40 years that, you know, I think most of us in this country or around the Western world, we've become kind of dull to it, right? Uh, we see these, these, you know, we see images of bus explosions in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and uh, dead people lying in the street, and we just kind of get, kind of get dull to it, don't we? We got dull to it, I think, in here until a month ago. Those horrific images coming out of Israel a month ago recently, I think, have really stirred most of us to concern. But I wanted to conclude this on a good note, and we do know that there is a time coming when Israel and the rest of Palestine will again become peaceful and prosperous. I want to close with two final scriptures, and I'd like for both for all of us to turn to these. First of all, let's turn to Ezekiel eleven seventeen. Turn to Ezekiel eleven seventeen. It's a prophetic scripture about Palestine in the end time. Eleven seventeen. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you, Israel, from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. We know that today, the Jews, of course, the descendants of the tribes of Judah and Levi primarily, and this is what the world recognizes as Israelites today, but we know that the lost ten tribes, we have, we have a very good idea, don't we? of who the lost 10 tribes really are. We, some of us sitting in this room, are likely descendants of those lost 10 tribes. So God says, I will again bring all of Israel together in the millennium into the land of Israel, and they will inhabit it. Let's turn to the final passage to Amos 9.14. Amos 9.14. Always have trouble getting to Amos. There it is. Got lucky today. Amos 9.14. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall make gardens and eat fruit of them. I'll continue on to verse 15. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be plucked up from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. We know that 3,000 years ago, God began to work through a man named Abraham. And he says, I will give to you and your inhabitants the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, as it was called then. And your descendants will be as the stars of the sea, and you will always possess this land. That's going to happen again, brethren. We know that in the end time, at Christ's return, Israel will again be returned en masse this time, not just the Jews. And, of course, Israel is only, only contains a part of the world's Jews. There are as many Jews in New York City today as there are in the whole land of Israel. So God will bring his people, all of Israel, 
from the nations, out of the tribulation, the remnants, back to, is, back to the land of Israel. At Christ's return, after the horrors of the tribulation and the, and the day of the Lord, Christ will return not only the Jewish people, but all Israel to the land. There will be no more Gaza Strip or the West Bank, you know, full of hateful terrorists bent on killing innocent men, women, and children. There will be no more Hamas, which Hamas basically means chaos. It's Arabic for chaos. There will be no more Hamas. There will be no more Hezbollah. There will be no more Islamic Jihad. There will be no more Islamic Brotherhood. God will unify all of Palestine as the homeland of his people, as he did in the time of Joshua. Jerusalem, as we know, will be the world's capital, the world's capital from where Christ will rule all nations. Brethren, we just finished celebrating that time at the Feast of Tabernacles. May God speed the day when that peaceful vision will finally be revealed, be fulfilled. <laughs>